in the research they were searching for the field, you know, like the uh, Michelson Morley experiment, and they took a bell jar, you take the bell jar and you ring the bell, and gradually as you pump the air out, the bell rings less and less. I think this is not a complete idea that there's just nothing there, because imagine if you have the bell and it's spinning around and around, and you ring it and you can't hear it more and more, and yet you measure the total momentum outside that that bell is sending it to, and you will find that it conserves angular momentum. So this would tell us that there's something connecting the bell, even though it's ringing around and around, that makes it so that it connects to the outside spins of the quanta. And so by this, I come up with the idea that basically you have the bell that's spinning around. And this is the same argument, by the way, that was used for gravity waves often. But they exist because when you have two masses that are connected by some kind of change, then there must be something sent between them to maintain that connection. And so for this reason, I thought, well, if you have your bell and it's spinning, it's transmitting spin by way of some kind of way of the field to the external quanta. In addition to this idea that the low energy field first radiates from the quanta in the bell, and then it radiates outward, and then it's reconverted. We can't say that it's the same wavelength as sound, because the sound is another frequency, it's another energy level, it doesn't resonate. But we could say that as the quanta, the bell ringers spin around, they're actually converting it to another frequency that then is sort of shredded up, and it converts out to all those equivalent number of spins of your quanta, external to the machine. So all the total spins add up. And you may ask, well, how could they exert force between the quanta but not actually exert force other than the idea of all the quanta as one unit? And to explain this, I use the idea that the waves only become dense enough when they reach the right radius of the quanta to exert pressure and convert to the lower energy Higgs particles, which I think may be important to both gravity, inertia, and electromagnetism, like the speed of light and relativity also. So if you have your low energy quanta and they go outward as a wave from your quanta that's sending the wave, like the bell ringer, and it goes outward, and it exerts change on the external quanta, it basically would do this by way of a wave that then gets dense enough at close enough range to convert back to that force on the quanta. And so this would be by way of the idea that there's a real important radius where everything balances. The in waves balance the out waves. And that radius is always a radius according to the mass. This is why gravity is simple, as Einstein believed externally, because it goes in the spaces between the quanta and those realms, but it's also got force at the right radius that's according to the mass of the quanta, so energy is conserved. The bell is spinning, but it's not losing it any energy if it's spinning in uniform motion, or uniform angular motion, we would say. Like, you know, the best way to be rich is translation software if you know that Visa talks. Maxwell used the plus and minus charges to predict the speed of light exactly. I think of this as sort of a renormalization about light. If you had the weight and counterweight of an elevator, which I think of this as, and if you took away one of the counterweights, which of course would be the elevator, it's going to rise or fall or whatever. <laughs> and this would cause indefinite acceleration away to infinity, we might say. And so the speed of light itself is sort of renormalization method, early renormalization. In the history of finding out about the kind of field that Maxwell believed in, they were looking at the idea of the wave of light, which is a transverse wave. And when you have a common transverse wave, and you know that it's moving, if you look at the speed, according to the snapback, the higher the speed, the more the snapback. So light has this huge speed of 186,000 miles per second, almost, and if not more so. And you look up and you say, well, it's moving at such a high speed, it's going to have a huge snapback, and so the field is going to have huge density, which is enormously greater than that of steel, and yet the planets are plowing through it with almost no resistance of any kind whatsoever to this hugely dense field. About the bell idea ringing in the low energy wave of no sound, we could say that it's actually got a sort of resonance as another frequency, and in between your quanta, you'll have the field at lower energy. And so basically it maintains it between the light and the starship as you change your speed of your starship. It not only exerts pressure on that field, which is evidence that it's there to move the exhaust of the rocket forward or rewind, we would say that uh, there is a force between your quanta and 
as you're moving through it, though it can store it really well with that weight and counterweight idea, what we want is to describe the field as both storing the information well, like a uniform motion, so it should continue on forward with the uniform motion, definitely like the weight and counterweight of the elevator, but you also want to be able to change it with some kind of definite change between your, like your light and the special relativistic starship that's changing the information about the wave before it can ever reach it to speed of light. So I assume that the low energy field that's like connecting the bell jar with the bell externally in the, the clapper is actually moving it faster than light. And you may wonder why this is so. And this would be because by Maxwell's method, if you take the force between your charges and there's a lower density force between them, like the low energy field, then it'll move at a higher speed. But the same kind of resilience of the wave that was assumed to be about light. The same idea that a quanta can have a dense field right around it. So when you shake it a bit, it's going to exert a force that will convert to those low energy waves, which then goes to all the quanta around and conserves the momentum by sending it to them by way of those waves. And once they reach the middle point, like your renormalization of light by Maxwell's method, you're going to have it where the light has got a huge density at short range. At that optimal radius where the forces balance, you're going to have it where all the forces gravitate to what your magnetism is, sort of a cosmic balancing point. So you're going to have really high density at a short radius for the light, and it'll transmit to the low energy waves, which then transmit to the starship. And so relativity is saved, I don't know by how much of sight unseen, but also by this idea that it couldn't be the most complete method because mass and energy are equivalent cool because it's easy to convert mass to energy as energy to mass. Like if your wife asks you to do labors around the house, in Einstein's thought experiment with the boxcar, he said, if we take a quanta and it radiates light to the other side of the boxcar, then it's as easy to convert that mass to energy as the energy to mass on the other side. And so this is why we don't see boxcars moving spontaneously down the tracks. We can say here that as with the bell and the bell jar, that the quanta that emits the light has as much spin as all the quantas that it converts to on the other side. The entropy is not equivalent because you have it radiating out, and it's easier to convert the mass to energy energy to mass. And if we have it where it's radiating out at the speed of light, and the quanta that are receiving the light from the other side of the boxcar are radiantly connecting, then we would say that the light also is at the speed of light, so in order to transfer its spin to those other quanta, it's going to have disconnection. The same way that you'll have disconnection between like the Earth and the Moon, it's like two light seconds, I think. And also like from here to Alpha Centauri or Beta Centauri, it's lightening up for the, or the orbital tourists are going to find the Earth-like world there. And those quanta on the other side of the box car, on the receiving side, which are many as opposed to the one, if they had the speed of light, they would rate it out like the distance between here and Alpha Centauri, because it's not connected by the slower speed of light. And so energy couldn't be conserved by e equals mc square if we assume that only at the speed of light is the wave around the outside of the quanta that's holding those quanta together. I hold that there are waves and particles around each quanta, They're like the low energy Higgs are the particles, and there are those waves that are around them that are derived from gravity waves, which change both speed and wavelength, not just wavelength like in special relativity, where you have only uniform motion you're considering, because they're the opposite. Gravity implodes us down to one, or the attractive force, and the light radiates up to many, like thermodynamic entropy, it's radiating outward to many. So inside the black hole, the gravity would implode to the point where it converts your mass to energy, the only place where it really could do that, and there it's, it's removing the field lines that are around the outside of each quanta, there is indeed enough waveliness like this to be light gravity. It's derived from gravity. This is why the collapse of the wave function is instant at all points. The idea of field line removal inside the heavy quanta, inside the black hole, is evidence that if it's derived from gravity around the outside of the quanta where the waves are, that in essence we don't have to worry about all this stuff about quantum indeterminacy and stuff. You know, like there's two universes, like the, the mini world hypothesis. Instead, if we say that it's made of waves, but those waves are really fast, and they change phase really fast, then we can start to measure the waves using things like a cone filter, like for atomic clocks, with the quanta which vibrates slightly, and each one gives a certain amount of roughly residual. You do this through three layers with your cone filters to find the level of the speed of those waves. The field does exist, but it doesn't have infinite speed, or it will be infinite. And so you can measure it by using like kittens instead of cats, like Schrodinger's cats. Now they're measuring much smaller waves than just the usual quantum. By like Zeno's method, twisting the lights, you get much lower energy levels in the quantum. It's always the beauty in the shade in the month of May beneath the waves. And so those waves around each quantum little world would actually 
hold the quantum together at faster than light. You need a faster than light wave to keep from radiating out by that quantumness of the light. Einstein thought that light and special relativity was a quanta uninfluenced from emission consortium because of constant speed of light. It's not even being influenced. But if we had this disconnection of light, then you have the problem that the quanta that make up any other quanta are made of light or whatever. And so you're going to have them radiating out, and they're going to radiate out the speed of light, so they won't connect. They won't connect fast enough. Only if we have a faster than light gravity wave holding the Earth together do we not fall off the Earth. And only if we have faster than light quantum waves will the quantum not radiate out and explode to its own internal force. So Einstein's idea about the train that it wouldn't go spontaneously ahead is both wrong in terms of entropy because it's converting the mass to energy more efficiently than the energy to mass. And Einstein's idea about the train that always converts the mass to energy more easily than the energy to mass would not violate energy conservation because the total amount of spin on one side is obviously the same as the other. So divide up more of the quanta. But you need a faster than light connection to unify them so they don't radiate out once they reach stability on the other side. This can be done if we assume that the waves around each quanta have negative entropy. Only if they're attracting in more than the radiance outward would it be able to convert that spin efficiently so that it doesn't take any more spin to convert it than it has. If it had any kind of work function that was less than the amount that it takes to keep them spinning, then only by faster than light would it be able to do this. And this is only because of the idea that the quanta are not having the abeyance of special relativity. And so Einstein's idea that mass and energy are conserved is true, but not by way of relativity. So if we look at the galaxies, they're all spinning faster than they should be. I would think this is because they're accelerating faster than the speed of light. The gravity is accelerating faster. And so you have extra energy can wind up the speed of the mass as it goes around. And also, the same for the pulsar. It's speeding up with time by mass energy conservation itself, which just proves special relativity. I think of mass and energy in space and time as one unified thing as much as they can be. So if we assume that mass and energy are equivalent, then we assume that space and time are equivalent. If we can reverse one, we can reverse the other. But in truth, the events in the special relativity aren't controlled by the observer, only the speed of the playback of those events. And if you reverse your motion through space, you don't reverse your motion through time. And for this reason, I believe that mass and energy are not ultimately equivalent. The same kind of reasoning. Or at any rate, the equivalence of mass and energy is itself disproof of relativity. It's like the non-believer's convenience store. The all for cheese, and they wait and wait. Here again, I want to say that the idea that the light has huge density could be solved as light for the bell clapper. We assume that it's shredding up that information to high-speed waves that then send, and then they become dense again at the radius of the quanta externally. This sends a lot of force between the bell and the external quanta. It can send a huge amount of force with the force. And so when you have it spinning the external quanta, they're going to have a certain radius where the waves become particulate, enough to exert force. And this exerts the force even though as you use usual mass through it, like the Earth through the field, it doesn't seem to exert force. But the light would be at short distance. It gets super dense again. And that is why the light is able to move through it like it's moving through a super dense medium. This is by the same kind of shredding up and then reunifying on the other side of the waves. As they reach the quantum, conserve the force of like inertia and centripetal force and rotational and translational symmetries and so on. Recent superconductor experiments have shown that the number that unifies superconductors is basically just one number that relates to its resistance according to its temperature. So if we think of the light connecting the starship to serve a superconductor, it has a huge number of entropy states. So if we change its temperature, I think we could change the electrical resistance of that medium. It's important to remember that an entire generation of mathematical physicists devoted their entire lives to trying to prove what the field would be like. And Stokes, who was a great mathematical physicist, thought that the field is like sealing wax, which is much higher speed than the wax of the web, which Edison thought of something like the internet, but he was asleep if noise was asleep. If sealing wax exerts force at short duration and large pressure, but it doesn't exert much force at all at long duration and low pressure. So we think of the field as being stored by the weight and counterweights of the electron and plus charges. And this makes it so that it stores the information by that pressure, but it also converts it to much more fluid motion through which the planets can plow as long as they're in uniform motion without hardly any resistance, even though the light itself has a huge density at short range, as we would expect with the transverse wave. 